Good evening and welcome. It's so good to see each one of you that are here with us tonight. And if you're joining us online, we'd like to wish you a, a wonderful Thanksgiving this week. Thank you for joining us. We're going to stand uh, here and begin a song. There is power in the blood. Let's sing together. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood. wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? this hour. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless on the white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Amen. That's a great testimony if you can say that, that the Lord is our Savior and our Redeemer, and uh, He has made us glad. We are glad that you're here tonight. I, we knew this uh, midweek service uh, gets some folks with the change from Wednesday to Tuesday, and then, of course, we have a lot of people traveling already for the uh, Thanksgiving vacation holiday week, and schools have been out now for a few days. But we are glad that you're with us tonight. And those joining us online, thank you so much 
for being a part of the service. We do have our children's ministry going and the teens and some college kids around, and so we are just welcoming you here tonight. Thank you for being here. Let's get started with prayer, and then we're going to share just a quick uh, announcement or two uh, before we get back to another song. And Pastor Paul Long has this midweek uh, Thanksgiving message for us tonight. So let's look to the Lord in prayer together. Father, we thank you for this time in your house. And Lord, uh, we are grateful for the opportunity to uh, just be a part of this church family and to come together tonight, uh, this special week of thanks and uh, blessings and uh, just honoring you, Lord, for all that you have done. Uh, even in the midst of this crazy, crazy year, uh, Lord, you have proven yourself strong and faithful and consistent. Uh, and Lord, you have uh, uh, been our anchor through all of this, and we are grateful for that promise and that testimony. And Lord, we thank you for the blood of the Lamb and uh, by our redemption uh, through, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would uh, meet the special needs of the prayer requests that we've had this week of several folks that have lost loved ones and uh, Lord, those that are dealing with surgeries uh, or recovering from those. Uh, Lord, those that are dealing with uh, COVID and uh, some family members extended. We had some uh, emails today about folks who have, have uh, relatives out of state and other places that are dealing with that. Uh, we ask, Lord, for your healing touch to be upon them. Uh, Lord, we pray for uh, this upcoming travel and all the th people that are going to be out and about. We ask for safety uh, physically, Lord, and uh, watch over them and their travels. And Lord, bless the message tonight with Pastor Paul and uh, Lord, what you've put on his heart. We thank you for a great day on Sunday, and we look forward, uh, Lord, to uh, the upcoming events here at Bible Baptist Church. Bless our gathering together in this time around your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, and please be seated. Um, we just have a couple announcements before Brother Jody leads us. And uh, remember that uh, the church office is closed tomorrow at noon. And so if you have need of anything that comes up, uh, I can help you in any way but cook a turkey. I cannot do that. Uh, so you'll have to call Butterball or somebody about that. But uh, if something happens Paul, and uh, one Paul, that's all. One Paul, that's all. That's all we got to do. <laughs> Uh, but if you have need of assistance, spiritual assistance, uh, any emergencies that arise, uh, anything that we can do to help, uh, several of the staff guys are in town, and we will respond as soon as we can. So uh, don't hesitate to call, and we're here to serve and to help and to meet uh, the needs of our church family any way that we can. Uh, and then there will be prayer meetings Saturday, men, for a prayer meeting at 8 o'clock here in Victory Hall behind us. And then uh, on Sunday, our full schedule of services um, remember that we do have a mask-only uh, service on video, also in Victory Hall in the 8 o'clock and 10.30 services. Few people have made uh, uh, availability of that. They've used that, uh, but uh, uh, we ha want to make sure you know about it and that it is available on those morning worship services. So we'll tell you more in the pastor's page and again on Sunday uh, with some new uh, outlooks for December as uh, this year is rapidly coming uh, to a close. So before Brother Paul comes, Brother Jody, you come right ahead, please. Let's sing a little bit. Love 
for God's love. Amen. Amen. Brother Paul? Well, good, good evening. It is good to see you here tonight. I appreciate you being here. I know it's, uh, as we're getting closer to Thanksgiving, a lot of people are traveling. Um. And, uh, but I do appreciate your faithfulness in being here tonight. I, uh, I'm going to start out with a little joke, okay? It's just us home folks, all right? So we're going we, to... Now, see, that wasn't even funny, and y'all are laughing already. I, I appreciate that. I do. I appreciate the encouragement. But let's get started, okay? <coughs> Last Wednesday, a passenger in a taxi heading for Midway Airport leaned over to ask the driver a question, and gently tapped him on the shoulder to get his attention. The driver screamed, lost control of the cab, nearly hit a bus, drove up over the curb, and stopped just inches from a large plate window. For a few moments, everything was silent in the cab. Then the shaking driver said, are you okay? I'm so sorry, but you scared the daylights out of me. The badly shaken passenger apologized to the driver and said, I didn't realize that a mere tap on the shoulder would startle someone so badly. The driver replied, no, no, I'm the one who is sorry. It's entirely my fault. Today is my very first day driving a cab. I've been driving a hearse for 25 years. I think that would cause me to run off the road a little bit as well, wouldn't it? So I I thought that was pretty cute. Well, we, I don't know about you, but I'm ready for 2020 to be over. Um, I was talking to somebody the other day, and I was like, well, it's got to get better next year. And I was like, you need to be quiet, because <laughs> you really don't know if next year is going to be any better. But uh, <coughs> um, I, I've got to be honest, I, especially since the election, I, I've just been kind of discouraged, frustrated, uh, and just out of sorts. Personally, and I, you know, I was feeling, you know, kind of, you know, I, and and especially since the election. I mean, the whole year has just been, you know, an emotional roller coaster. But with the election, I just <coughs> it seemed to be the for me the final straw, and I was so discouraged and so down. And I was listening to the radio, and I heard this message, and it really encouraged me. And so I was like, well. You know, I'm probably not the only one struggling with discouragement. So this is, that's why I want to bring you this message tonight. It, it really encouraged me. It strengthened my faith. I got my attitude right. You know, you know, sometimes we get into stinking thinking, even pastors. I know you think we're perfect, and I tell my kids I'm perfect. But, but we struggle just like you do. Okay, we're human just like you are. And we're going to be in the book of Ruth. <clears throat> And what I love about this story, the the book of Ruth, is there's no superheroes in this book. You know, there's no Moses, there's no um, (coughs) Abraham, there's no David, uh, there's no Elijah, there's no miracles. 
in this book. There's no fire come down from heaven. There's no parting of the Red Sea. There's no sun standing still uh, while Gideon fought, fought the battle. There, there's no major miracles. There's no major superheroes. This book is about ordinary people expressing everyday faith. Ordinary people expressing everyday faith. And that's kind of why I like it. Because that's the way I see myself. Just a, I'm just an average, run-of-the-mill Christian. Um, and I think that's why I enjoyed hearing this story again <coughs> excuse me, on the radio. Now, let's, look at, let's start off. We're going to have a long background, long introduction, and then some, a few points. Well, there's seven points, actually. Or maybe eight. I don't remember now. But they'll be real quick, okay? They'll be real quick, I promise. Let's, let's get into the introduction, into the background. We do not know for certain who the author of the book of Ruth is. It is anonymous. Now, there are a lot of people who believe that it was the prophet Samuel. Um, Jewish tradition holds that Samuel is the one who wrote the book. He, he wrote the book as a bridge between the book of Judges and his anointing of David as king uh, over Israel. <clears throat> now, and even though Samuel wrote the book, the actual the events took place during the book of Judges. And, and we're going to look at that and what impact that actually has on the story. <coughs> so let's look at this here. Um, it takes place during the book of Judges. And if you know anything about the book of Judges, okay, it, the, the, the book of Judges is characterized by spiritual adultery, <clears throat> immorality, and anarchy. Now, does that sound familiar? Does that sound like America today? Spiritual adultery, <clears throat> immorality, and anarchy. And, you know, I, I know in Scripture that America is nowhere in prophecy in the end times. I, you know, I understand that. I just never thought I would see it in my lifetime. Or, uh, and, and my concern is that is where we're headed. Um, but I just never thought I would see it. But this book of Judges is very similar to where we in America are today. In the book of Judges, there is this cycle repeated throughout the book. A cycle of sin. The Israelites would start worshiping false gods. A cycle, and then there would be servitude. God would allow them to be judged by sending a foreign country in to defeat them and to rule over them. And then the the Jews would cry out in supplication to God. They would repent and cry out in supplication to God. God would hear their prayers and he would send a savior in the form of a judge who would help deliver the people from whichever country had invaded them. So we saw in the book of Judges sin, servitude, supplication, and savior. And, it, and there were seven judges in the book of Judges, and it repeated that cycle seven different times. And, and we all are familiar with the verse <coughs> in Judges. In Judges 21, verse 25, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And again, doesn't that sound familiar with where America is right now. We have situation ethics. We have people who do not believe in any absolute truth whatsoever. I mean, that is exactly the way it was during the book of Judges. And we are seeing that played out in our country today. <clears throat> now, there are some things we can learn from the book of, Ju uh, from, from the book of Ruth. And I want to go ahead and list them to start with before we actually... <coughs> get into breaking down the chapter. Number one, the book of Ruth shows God's faithfulness to faithful people. Regardless of what, where your country is, God is faithful to faithful people. 
And we see that throughout the book of Judges. We especially see it right here in the book of Ruth, where even in the midst of, uh, of anarchy, uh, spiritual adultery, immorality, there's a godly man, there's a godly woman, God brings them together and blesses them. In the midst of all the chaos that was going on around them. It shows that we can live godly lives among the godless. <clears throat> and of course, as our country drifts further and further away from our Judeo-Christian beliefs, it is becoming more and more godless. It also shows that there is no such thing as co coincidence. As believers, we need to understand the providence and the sovereignty of God. God is in control Nothing happens without him first allowing it. And we need to understand that. You know, I told you I was struggling with discouragement. And you know why I was struggling with discouragement? Because I started looking at all the problems around me. Right? Just like Peter did. When he was walking on the water, what did he do? He started looking at the waves. And, and it's, it's so easy to get caught up in that. Instead of keeping our focus on Christ and continuing to be faithful, understanding that God is control and nothing, absolutely nothing happens to me unless God allows it. Nothing. And I can trust in His providence and in His sovereignty because I know he loves me more than I can ever comprehend. So, number one, uh, the book of Ruth shows us God's faithfulness to faithful people. Number two, the book of Ruth shows we can live godly lives among the godless. Number three, shows no such thing as coincidence, only providence. And number four, shows us that no person is outside the reach of God's grace. And this is specifically talking about Ruth. Ruth, who was a Moabite. She grew up in a country that worshipped a false god, the god Chemosh. And one of the rituals for the god Chemosh was child sacrifices. Where they would burn these children on the altar and sacrifice to their god. And that's the religion she grew up in. If you, But even though she grew up in that religion, she chose to become a proselyte Jew and to be part of God's chosen people. So that's, some, that's, the, that's the aim of this book of Ruth. Some, but, and now let's look at the arrangement. This arrangement was uh, put out by Warren Wearsby. He came up with this short little outline. Chapter 1 is about weeping. We're going to see that here in just a minute. Chapter 2 is about working. Chapter 3 is about waiting. And chapter 4 is about wedding. So very simple, weeping chapter 1, working chapter 2, waiting chapter 3, and wedding chapter 4. That's kind of the breakdown of the book. Now I want to talk about some of the people in, this, in the book. I call them actors just because I'm trying to keep the alliteration with A all the way down. Okay, so actors. There's Elimelech. His name means my God is king. Naomi, whose name means pleasant. But she decides to change her name to Mara, which means bitter. She has two, they have, Elimelech and Naomi have two sons. One's named Malon. His name means sickly. Now, <laughs> how would you like to be named Malon? You know, in, in, in biblical days, they would name their kids after some sort of and it, it, it indicated what they were like. So the first one was Malon. The second one was Chilion. And his name meant pining. Pining. So I'm thinking, as I'm reading uh, the names of these, these young men and what it meant, I'm like, boy, these guys were a great catch, weren't they? One was sickly and one was pining. Sounds like someone I would like to, you know, if I had a daughter, introduce them to. 
But no, 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 no. And then there's Ruth, and her name means friendship. Her name means friendship. <coughs> and often she is referred to in the book as Ruth the Moabitess. If you know about how the, the Moabites came about, they were the result of an incestuous relationship between Lot and his oldest daughter. If you remember, Lot lived in Sodom and Gomorrah, and when God... Lot and his two daughters and his wife left the city. Of course, his wife turned back and turned into a pillar of salt. And he and his two daughters got away into a mountain. Well, the daughters had relations with their father because they thought that the world was destroyed. And out of those two daughters came two tribes, the Moabites out of the oldest daughter and the Ammonites out of the youngest daughter. Now think of that history in Ruth's life, that that's, you know, that's how her tribe got started. And of course, the fact that they worship false gods. Orpah, who was married to Chilion, her name, now don't point, okay? I'm just asking you. Don't point when I, t when I tell you what her name means, okay? Especially husband and wives. Her name, Orpah, means stubborn, means stubborn. <laughs> now, how would you like to be named stubborn? And the last actor in this story, other than God, of course, is Boaz, Boaz. And his name means, in him is strength. Now, the area of Moab was situated on the eastern side of the Dead Sea. Judah, which is where Elimelech and Naomi were from, and specifically from the city of Bethlehem, is on the western side of the Dead Sea. Now, what I'd like for us to do is go to Ruth. We're going to start in chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to go quickly through chapter 1. My primary focus wants to, I, I want to be is on chapter 2. But let's look at Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. It says, now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled. So this tells you when this story takes place. That there was a famine in the land. Now, there, the question is, was the famine a natural cause or was it judgment by God? Because God, in Deuteronomy chapter 24, told the people of Israel that he would judge the nation of Israel if they worshipped false gods. And one of the ways in which he would judge them was through famines. So the question is, was this famine divine judgment or was it a natural phenomenon? We don't know. My personal opinion, divine judgment. But that's my opinion, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in this country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Now it's interesting that Elimelech and Naomi and their two sons were from Bethlehem and that there was a famine in Bethlehem. Because what does the word Bethlehem mean? House of bread. And yet in a city that was a very <coughs> agricultural area that was... Um, known for uh, being like a breadbasket area. There was famine. <coughs> and it says here that Elimelech and then went to sojourn. That means to dwell temporarily. Elimelech was not planning on going to Moab and staying there forever. He just planned, he, you know, he, he saw that there was a famine in the land. He says, you know, let's go, let's go to Moab. Uh, there's not a famine there, you know, we'll have food to eat. And, and we'll just stay there a short while, and then we'll, you know, when the famine's over, we'll come back to Bethlehem. Now, was that a good decision? I don't think so. Because the nation of Israel was God's special place for the people of Israel. Remember when Abraham, when there was a famine in the, in the land and Abraham left where God told him to, to, to stay and he went down to Egypt? And what happened when he got down in Egypt? He got into a whole lot of trouble. And the same situation takes place here with the Limelech. 
He leaves God's designated place for the people of Israel, and he goes somewhere that worships a false god that would be a snare possibly to him and his family, and he lives there. And what is interesting is, while he was only planning to be there for a short time, he ended up staying there 10 years. 10 years. Now, <clears throat> men, remember this. We don't get to make decisions in isolation. The decisions we make as the leaders of our families, as the head of our household, it affects our families, it affects our friends, and it affects our community. And we see that in this decision by Elimelech, where he made a decision to go to Moab. He ended up staying there for a longer period of time. He ended up dying in Moab, and not, and not only did he die, but the two sons died in Moab as well. There's a saying, I'm sure many of you have heard it, that says, Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. And I believe that the decision Elimelech made is an example of that. It ended up, he ended up staying longer in Moab than he probably intended. He ended up losing his life there, and it the lives of his two sons, and he left his wife alone with two daughter-in-laws. Now, of course, in verse 5, um, it says, And Malon and Chilion died, also both of them, and the woman was left her two sons and her husband. Verse 6 uh, it says, Then she arose, this is Naomi, with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people and giving them bread. Okay, so Elimelech dies, Malon and Chilion die, Naomi hears that the famine is over in Bethlehem. So she decides to return to Bethlehem. Now, when she gets back, well, initially both of her daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, leave with her on the way back to Bethlehem. But Naomi tells them, look, you guys need to stay here. You need to stay in your, your homeland. I can't provide sons for you to, to have new husbands. You need to stay here so that you can find another husband. Orpah at first says no, but then she relents and decides to stay but notice Ruth's response. Look in verse uh, 16 and 17. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. I can't help but wonder what it was that Ruth saw, or, or why she felt the way she did about Naomi. Uh, was it her personality? Of course, her name means pleasant. Was she just attracted to her personality? Did, did uh, Naomi give her a family that, that maybe she didn't have in her own parents? I don't know, but whatever the reason, it's important to understand that Ruth was willing to leave behind her mother and father, her family, her faith, her, her home, and go back to Bethlehem with Naomi. Now, you know, they didn't have Social Security back then. They didn't have welfare back then to take care of widows and, and, uh, back then. When, when a husband died, when the, when the sons died, there was no means of support for Naomi and for Ruth and Orpah. I mean, there was nothing. They, had, they were left penniless. So in verses 19 to 21, they go back to 
in Bethlehem. And notice, notice if you will, Naomi's response when they get back to Bethlehem. Verse 19. So they too went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And they said, Is this Naomi? And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi. Call me Mara. In other words, don't call me pleasant anymore. Call me bitter. For the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. Who is Naomi blaming here for the problems that happened in her life? She's blaming God. But now let's, let's be honest. Isn't it human nature to do that? Look, we've been blame shifting since Adam and Eve, <laughs> right? We are always looking to cast the blame on somebody else. And if it's not a spouse, then it's God. But no, I just, you just see in her response a bitterness. I don't know that I can say I blame her. She lost her husband. She lost her two children, and as a parent, you know, and, and as difficult as it, it is, as it is to lose a spouse, and that, that's in, incredibly difficult, but to also lose your children, that's a parent's greatest fear, is it not? But look at the difference between how Naomi responded and how Job responded. How did Job respond? When he lost all his kids, did he blame God? No. No, he didn't. And that's what I want us to see here. The the difference in Job's response and Naomi's response, and Ruth especially, how she handled the loss of her husband as well. Now chapter 2, and here's where I want to spend most of my time. Chapter 2. We see her, uh, the requ- her request. This is Ruth's request in verses 1 and 2. And no- Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. So here we are introduced to Boaz before Boaz is introduced to Ruth. God begins a work before Boaz is even comes into contact with Ruth. You know, and that's one of the things I... Have you ever thought about this fact? That Christ grew the tree that he was going to be crucified on. He planted it way ahead of time to grow, knowing that that would be the cross he'd be crucified on. Have you ever had God begin to work something before you even had a need? And then when the need came, God, the provision was already there. That's what we're seeing here in the book of Ruth. And if we're not careful, we can, we can have our pity parties. We can say, life is not fair. And guess what? It's not. We can whine and complain. We can blame God. We can blame our spouse. We can blame the government. We can blame anybody and everybody. But God is still in control. And God still loves you. And God still loves me, even in the valleys. You know, usually it's in the valleys where we grow the most. We don't normally grow on the mountaintops, do we? Life's too good, man. Things are great. Man, I got good health. I got, you know, money in the bank. I'm feeling good. I got a new car. Not really, but we don't grow very much on the mountaintop. It's in the valleys that we tend to grow. And we're going to see some growth in this story, both in Ruth, but also in Naomi. Verse 2, and Ruth the Moabite has said unto Naomi, let me now go to the field. Here's her request, okay? Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, go my daughter. So Naomi says go. Evidently, 
Ruth had heard that God provided for the poor in the nation of Israel by leaving the corners of the, fe- of the fields open for the poor and the strangers to glean. Somehow Ruth had heard about this. We don't know how, but, but <coughs> Ruth wakes up the next day. Now look, they've just traveled from Moab back to Bethlehem. It's about a seven days journey, okay? And the very next day, Ruth gets up and goes to work. And I want you to understand this. When life is tough, and it is, and at times it's more difficult than others, don't get discouraged and sit sit around. Ruth got up and she did the next thing. Here's a story about Elizabeth Elliot. Most of you know who's, who Elizabeth Elliot is. Uh, her husband, Jim, and several other missionaries were trying to reach the Alka Indians with the gospel of Christ. They were all killed. And so after uh, Jim Elliot was killed, here is Elizabeth Elliot, his wife, with a 10-month-old baby. And the question is, what does she do now? What does she do now? Does she go back to the United States? To her family? No. You know what she did? She and Jim had already started a church at the missionary station where they were. She goes back to the church and begins to work in the church. She trains the men so that they can preach. And she continues the missionary work. Eventually... She goes back to the Alka Indians who once kill, who killed her husband and she witnesses and evangelizes them. She actually leads the person to Christ who killed her husband. She did the next thing. When asked about her husband's death and her decision to continue the missionary work, she quotes a poem. It says, do it immediately, do it with prayer, do it reliantly, casting all care. Do it with reverence, tracing his hand, who placed it before thee with earnest command. Stayed on omnipotence, safe beneath his wing, leave all resultings. And here's where she came up with the phrase, do the next thing. And that is what we need to learn. When life is hard, when life's not fair, when things are going wrong, we need to remain faithful to the Lord. We need to keep going. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We've got to keep going. We cannot quit. It is not an option that we should consider. Just like Elizabeth Elliot, we need to do the next thing. And then we need to do the next thing. And then we need to do the next thing. And we just keep on doing the next thing until God pulls us out of that situation or until our attitude changes. She didn't take a day off. She didn't make an excuse. She didn't whine about her circumstances. She got up that next day and went to work. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd have probably said, Hey, I've been traveling for seven days. My feet hurt. I'm going to take the day off. But just think what would have happened if she had taken the day off. Is it quite possible she would have never have gone to that field and met Boaz? And if you know the story, Boaz ends up being the kinsman redeemer, redeems their land, marries Ruth, has a child. The child is the grandfather of the greatest king in Israel, David. But that may never have happened if she'd have sat on her backside the next day. So do the next thing. Number, t- number 
two, do it according to God's word. In Leviticus 19, verse 9 and 10, remember I said earlier about how it, uh, the Jews would leave the corners of the field? This is God's command to the people of Israel. Leviticus 19, verse 9 and 10 says this, And when you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corners of thy field, neither shalt thy... Uh, Glean thy vineyard, neither shalt thou gather every grape of thy vineyard. Thou shalt leave them for the poor and stranger. God made provision for the poor and for the stranger, but it didn't involve sitting on your backside and having it brought to you. You had to get up and go get it. So we see her request, verse 3, we see her reliance. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and her hat was to light on a part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. Now, th and this is the part I want you to get, okay? This is the part that really spoke to me, and it deals with the providence of God. Do you think it was accidental that, that Ruth ended up in the field of Boaz? Absolutely not. God was orchestrating behind the scenes for Ruth to go to this field. And that, for us as believers, listen to me, there is no such thing as coincidence. There is no such thing as luck. There is no such thing as fate or chance. And for heaven's sakes, don't read your horoscope Okay, because that's hogwash. <laughs> I know people who live by their horoscope. Goodness gracious. No, for the believer, there's the providence and sovereignty of God. And we can trust in that because God loves us more than we can ever comprehend. He... he Romans 8, 28, and we what, church? We know all things, not some things, not most things, all things work together for good to them which love God, to them which are the called according to His purpose. Now, we may not like everything that happened to us, and it may not be pleasant at times, but God takes the difficulties in our life, and He uses that to mold us into the person He wants us to become. And we can never forget that. We can never look around at our problems and at our circumstances and forget that we have a sovereign God that is working all things out for His glory and for our good. Never forget that, people. Her recognition in verse 5 through 7, Then said Boaz unto a servant that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is the Moabitish uh, damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Mo Moab. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. So everybody has heard the story about Ruth coming back with Naomi from Moab and how she is taking care of her mother-in-law. That's her recognition. Boaz is aware of the story. He's heard it. Notice his response in verses 8 through 16. In verse 8, he gives guidance. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearst thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from thence, but abide here fast by my maidens. He gives her guidance to stay in his field. Now, why would he do that? Because he's going to protect her. He's going to protect her. Because remember, remember that that this takes place during the time of the Judges. If you read the book of the Judges, there are some bad things that happen in the book of Judges. And Boaz is trying to protect this young woman from, from something bad happening to her. In verse 9, he offers protection. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art a thirst, go unto the vessel and drink of that which the young men have drawn. So he gives her guidance. He offers her protection. He, he uh, provides for her. 
He offers her encouragement, fellowship, acceptance, and he even lets her eat a, a meal with, with him and with, with the leaders. I heard it described this way. That's like having a temp being allowed to eat a meal with the business owner. That's, that's the analogy that is made when, when Boaz allows Ruth to come eat with them. Now, her reaping, and we've got to move quickly because we're running out of time. So I'm going I'm to skim through this a little faster. Her reaping, verse 7. She, uh, she came and hath continued even from the morning until now that she, t- that she tarried a little in the house. Notice her work ethic. Notice her work ethic. She starts early in the morning. And now jump to verse 17. Let me see it. Verse 17. So she gleaned in the field until even and beat out that she had gleaned and it was about an ephah of barley. So she starts early in the morning, works till even. They estimated it's about a 16 hour worth of work. Now that woman has a good work ethic. God blesses hard work. I truly believe it. God blesses, and if you turn, we're not going to turn for the sake of time, but in Proverbs chapter 6, he tells the people to go to the ant thou sluggard. Consider the ant. And, And we see in Ruth... Uh, someone who is a hard worker. Edison, if you've heard this quote before, Edison said genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. So he, we see in this young woman who even though life is hard, even though the circumstances are fair, this woman is willing to work, willing to get up and go out and get it. Notice her reputation in verses 10 and 11. Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? Notice Boaz's response to her. And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother in the land of thy nativity and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. She humbles herself in verse 10. She's, she's, she bows down before him. And then he, resp- he repeats to her her story, how she left her father and her mother. That's not an easy thing to do. If, and we're not for the sake of time, but in chapter 3, verse, well, let me just read chapter 3, verse 11 real quick. Boaz is talking to Ruth, and he says, And now, my daughter, fear not, I will do to thee all that thou requirest, for all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. That's her reputation. She's a virtuous woman. The word virtuous here is the same word used in Proverbs chapter 31, verse 10 that talks about a virtuous woman. It's the same word. So what does that tell you about Ruth and her character and her reputation? Of course, repetition is what others say about you. Character is who God knows you to be. (coughs) Her refuge, verse 12, The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, on whose wings thou art come to trust. Boaz prays for God to bless her, And isn't it ironic that Boaz prays for God to bless her and God uses Boaz to bless her? Isn't that ironic? Uh, Verses 17 to 13, her return. She goes back to Naomi. Naomi is amazed. Naomi, you know, Naomi's bitter. Naomi is sad. Naomi is a grouch. I don't know that I could blame her, but it does. But it is obviously she is not handling this the way that God wants us to handle it. I understand how, why she reacted that way, but notice in verses seventeen to nineteen 
how when Ruth bring, comes back and brings food with her to Naomi, Naomi comes back to life. Verse 17 through 19, So she gleaned in the field of evening, beat out that she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned, and she brought forth and gave to her that she had reserved after she was survived. And her mother-in-law said unto her, Where hast thou gleaned today, and where wroughtest thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. And, of course, she tells her that the man who took care of her was Boaz. And Naomi says, hey, he's a kindred redeemer. Of course, Ruth doesn't understand what's going on here. But, but Naomi understands that this man, Boaz, could redeem them, could take care of them. And so we see in verses 17 to 19 her amazement. In verse 20, her adoration and then in verses 21 to 23, the advice she gives to Ruth. Then in verse 20, we see her Redeemer. And Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord, who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said unto her, The man is near of kin to us, one of our next kinsmen, or our near kinsmen. Now we don't understand that much in the way in today in our society here in America. But the kinsman redeemer, or in the Hebrew, Goel, he could redeem the property that had been lost and marry the widow of the deceased near relative to raise up children in the name of the dead relative, which in this case was Malon. You know what I find interesting about this? When Ruth got back to Bethlehem with Naomi, she didn't go out hunting for a husband. Instead, she went to work, and a husband found her. I, I, you know, I know there are people out there who are lonely, who are looking for a spouse, whether it be a, a, a woman looking for a husband or, or a man looking for a wife. But I think if you get busy about, and, about being and doing God's work, God will bring the person into your life that he wants you to have. Don't go out looking for a husband. Don't go out looking for a wife. Instead, go out looking to be obedient to God's will and then see what God wants, what God brings to your life. So that's chapter 2, chapter 3. Naomi instructs Ruth concerning Boaz in verses 1 through 7. Boaz agrees to be the kingsman redeemer in verses 8 through 15. Ruth rehearses to Naomi all Boaz told her. Chapter 4, Boaz speaks to a nearer kinsman, someone between him and them. Boaz ag agrees to marry Ruth in, in verses 11 through 12 of chapter 4. Boaz and Ruth have a child in verse 13. No Naomi takes care of the child in verses 14 through 16. And the child is named Obed. He is a grandfather to David, but is also, think about this, a Moabite woman has a child in the line and lineage of Christ. You know, it is amazing to me. God often takes people we never would consider and He uses them for His work. I'll, I'll never forget when I was in high school playing on a football team, one of the guys that was on the team his name was Greg Burzens. He's the meanest guy on the field. I mean, he was. He was mean. He'd clean your clock every chance he got. He was, he was downright mean. I ran into him about, well, it's been about 20 years ago now. He's a pastor now. I'm like, how in the world did that happen? But it is amazing. And now, that can be said of, of, of anybody, really. But I am amazed that God would take a, a Moabitess woman and put her in the lineage of our Savior. Nobody is too far for God to reach. Please understand that. Now, in summary, we'll close to that now. What can we learn from this message? The book of Ruth shows God's faithfulness to faithful people. Shows we can live godly lives among the godless. Shows no such thing as coincidence, only providence, and shows us no person is outside the reach of God's grace. And when difficulties come, and they will, I hope we respond more like Ruth 
than Naomi. Happy Thanksgiving. Uh, I'm going to close in prayer and then you are dismissed. I appreciate you being here tonight. Uh, I know with it, Thanksgiving this year is going to be different for a lot of people, but I wish you a happy Thanksgiving. Uh, I am looking forward to my grandkids coming over and filling them with sugar and sending them home with their parents. Right? That's just a little bit of revenge. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, Lord, may we ever be thankful of the fact that you love us, that you never leave us nor forsake us, that you've promised to, to always be there with us, Father. I, I, at times we get discouraged, we get frustrated, life doesn't seem fair, but you're always there, Lord, whether we see you or not. And may we, when these times come, May we respond by Ruth and do the next thing. <coughs> and may we do the next thing in accordance with your word. May we honor you. May we work hard. May everything we do be for your honor and for your glory. And Lord, may we keep our eyes open to the providence of God in our lives. Lord, we love you. But Father, more importantly, we know that you love us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.